Thank you. You may be seated. I guess on some of those hymns, the amen is slower than on others. <laughs> Let's take our hymnals, or excuse me, our Bibles, and turn now to that portion of Scripture that I just read from a moment ago out of Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10, looking at verses 1 through 20, the plague of locusts. And uh, as you are turning to that portion of Scripture, let me once again remind you about that insert that is in your bulletin. It's very important. You may not realize this because we tend to live in a, a cloistered environment, but right now, across evangelical America, not merely across secular America, but across evangelical America, there is a huge movement pressing for the approval of sodomite rights and that the church needs to get up with the times and start celebrating with those who practice what God calls a perversion. If you have any contacts in the so-called evangelical community, you will run into this sooner or later. And that insert that you got in your bulletin today gives you 40 questions that lead back to what does the Bible say about the subject and how can individuals who wave the gay flag, the rainbow flag, in evangelicalism support biblically what they are doing? A good number of questions for you to learn. You don't have to learn all 40, but pick a few that you think you can remember and then know the answers. Know what the passages of Scripture say that are found in that paper that I gave you. At the end of the paper, you will also find there's a new book out on the subject. Uh, written by a reformed pastor in Michigan uh, and he deals with these kinds of things all the time. He's not far from the University of Michigan. There are also a couple of websites that you can go to. First to see the so-called evangelical arguments for the gay position. Yes, there are people calling themselves evangelicals who are for the gay position and also answers to them. And I encourage you to look that up and to be well prepared because the battle has entered not merely liberalism, not merely the apostate churches, it has entered so-called evangelical and Bible-believing churches, and each of us needs to be prepared with the answers from God's Word. So I encourage you to, to read that carefully and pick a few of those questions that you think you can handle. Now let's turn back to that text in Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> As we've said, we've moved now into the final three stages of God's judgment, a judgment that happens both to individual people and to civilizations. And I'd like to make a comparison about those three things today. I was preparing for the message and I thought, you know, this is very, very much like what is happening in America today and Christians are sitting by and letting it happen. Number one was the removal of all life support. You know what came to my mind? This may offend some of you. Hospice care, the removal of all life support, just the palliative care that makes people feel good while they die. Just the wetting of their lips, removing all food and water from them, letting them starve to death and dehydrate to death until all their organs shut down. I'm opposed to that. I'm opposed to that. Always do all that you can to preserve life. You may think it's hopeless to let God determine the point of the end. You may think it's hopeless that you're being kind just by pumping them full of morphine as they die. Let God determine the end. Do all that you can for life. That's the pro-life position. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. 30 to 35 years ago, there was a, another Presbyterian pastor's wife who was in a very bad car accident. The doctors declared her brain dead. The doctors wanted to pull the plug and let her die. But her husband opposed the doctors wanting her to die. He cared for her passionately for the next seven years, doing everything possible to keep her alive. And suddenly one morning while he was standing by her bedside, she woke up. 
He could have killed her seven years before that legally with the doctor's approval, pulling the plug. That was 30 to 35 years ago. Within the last month, a child who was on life support and was going to have the plug pulled woke up 24 hours before they pulled the plug. The child is alive today. Dear people, the final three stages of God's judgment start with number one, the removal of all life support. The locusts ate everything. You know what that does? That's slow starvation, just like hospice care. Slow starvation, slow dehydration, which brings you to the second of those last three stages of judgment, utter spiritual dark darkness. That's like the body shutting down in hospice care. All the organs begin to close down one after another, after another, after another. Do you go into end stage renal failure and the heart no longer having enough fluid to pump through it begins to stress and stress and stress. And the fever reaches the brain. And more morphine is pumped into that person's body as the body struggles to stay alive. And people stand around and watch and do nothing. Utter spiritual blindness, the body shutting down as in hospice care, the inability to humanly perceive truth, that's the plague of darkness. And then finally, as also through hospice care, death. The removal of all future hope. That's the plague of the death of the firstborn. That's new material, I just threw it in today, even though you've heard those three stages before. We learn five key things about marks of the end of a civilization. First guard, harden the heart of Pharaoh and his servants. You see, they saw, they knew, they understood, they rebelled, they rejected what they knew to be true. That's what happens in the first part of the death of a civilization. It's happening here in America. It was the majority of the Egyptians that did that, and that resulted in the tipping point. And we're moving toward a tipping point in the United States if we've not already passed it. God's still hardening the hearts of people today. We saw that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, when the Antichrist shows up. It says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and because they deliberately rejected. That's what we see with Pharaoh. Because they deliberately rejected, it says, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What do you think the homosexual movement's all about? Second, God's purpose in hardening the heart of Pharaoh and the Egyptians was to teach future generations, that's us, about his character, power, nature, and sovereignty, to teach them that the living God is to be feared and not to be mocked or to be resisted. And that's our job, to teach our children and grandchildren. Third, the greatest sin underlying all other sins is pride. It's pride that keeps us from doing what we know to be the will of God doesn't matter how nice you are. If you know the will of God and you refuse to do it, you are under the judgment of God. And that's what also destroys nations. God hates pride because it is the chief sin of the devil. We saw that over in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 9 through 15. Never let those who are immature in the faith be placed in authority in the church because that sets them up for getting proud. And then God will judge them and through them the church. That's 1 Timothy 3, 6 and 7. Fourth, the fourth road marker that leads to the end of a civilization is this. Continued rebellion and refusal to obey God leads to the removal of all national life support. The locusts ate everything. The slow starvation death of a civilization and of individuals happens spiritually as well as physically. If you stubbornly refuse to do what you know God wants you to do for whatever reason, it will result in spiritual starvation. And I've read you twice this passage out of Amos. I'm going to read it again. Three verses. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, 
not a famine of bread, nor are the thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to e even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. That's a thirst for the word of God. Fifth, the fifth warning sign that civilization is coming to an end is this. Stubbornness prevents rational thinking and total humble submission to God. And as we've noted, God does not tolerate partial obedience. He does not cut deals. Never try to cut a deal with God. Pharaoh tried to bargain with God and make a counteroffer, and God said no, and God sent the locusts to him. The corollary lesson that we learned was, if you are under authority, never try to manipulate the one who is in authority over you. That applies to government, work, the church, and the home. We talked about wives trying to manipulate their husbands, children trying to manipulate their parents, trying to gang up on authority to put pressure on them. But remember, God is not pleased when you resist the authority that God has put in your lives. You do not want to be part of the collapse of your country or of your family or of your church. That brought us to two more surprising positive lessons that we learned from the plague of locusts. Number one, even a curse can be beneficial when viewed from God's perspective. And we saw that locusts were actually given by God in Leviticus 11.22 as a source of food. And all three different kinds of locusts that are in the Middle East are mentioned in Leviticus 11.22. So the lesson was the very means of starvation that God sent to Egypt was also a massive source of healthy, sustaining food. The Egyptians obviously didn't see it that way. Folks, when famine hits the United States, learn to think both biblically and creatively. And in that context, we talked about Thanksgiving in times of adversity. Some people have not learned what it means to be thankful for what God gives you. He's promised that what he gives you will meet your needs. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Some of you won't eat food that has an expiration date on the label. You throw away leftovers. You don't eat anything new. You follow the taste of your pagan culture. You let culture and peer pressure dictate what you eat and what you do and how you dress because you don't want to appear different from the pagans around you. We noted last week that that may be a sign that you're telling God that your real God is your belly, that you certainly won't want to offend your belly God. Oh, how many people serve their stomach whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Paul tells, that was Philippians 3.19. Paul tells us in the book of Colossians to set our affection on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set not your affection on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's why we set our affection on things above, not on the stuff that's on our plate. 1 Corinthians 6.13, meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. The real issue, which is one of the key lessons out of the plague of locusts, is a thankful heart. The issue is not fancy food or tasty food or food that I usually eat. The real issue is learning to thank God for what he provides. Remember the connection when famine hits the United States. Locusts, starvation. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And since we're talking about locusts, we looked at that key passage on thankfulness with food in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 6, and saw that every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The time is coming when God is going to teach us, his people, what it is to be thankful, even for food that today none of us would touch for a 10-foot pole. We gave you that illustration out of Second Kings about Ben-Hadab besieging Samaria, how the, ch the city was reduced to eating horrible things at insane prices, then finally was reduced to cannibalism of its children. And the government blamed the problem on the believers, just like Hitler blamed the problems of Germany on the Jews and launched the Holocaust. If it happens here in America, expect that the blame will fall on God's people. There's always got to be a scapegoat when something bad happens in a country. Who do you think will be the next scapegoat here in America? And so that brings us back to locusts and the food to keep you from starvation. 
John the Baptist ate locusts. That kept him alive. He's one of the most godly men in the Bible. Remember the lesson. The very means of starvation that God sent to Egypt was also a massive source of healthy, sustaining food. When the time of starvation comes, learn to think biblically and creatively and remember that lesson. The second lesson we learned that was a surprising positive lesson was that locusts are given to teach us wisdom. There are before things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. And you get down to the number three, the locusts have no king. Yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. Even little things in themselves are nothing, but when they are gathered together in numbers, their strength. You count as long as you band together with other Bible-believing Christians. Nothing can stop a plague of locusts, even the United Nations. They know that. They, they do their best to slow it down, but they can't actually stop it. How much more impossible would it be to stop the spread of the gospel if Bible-believing Christians banded together in prayer, totally dedicated to Christ and to reaching the lost and to making an impact for righteousness on our nation? But that brought us to the second half of the warning. In the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. Failure to function as a unit destroys any entity, whether it's a nation, a church, a business, or a family. And so that brings us to part four today. The final lesson that we learn from the locusts. The very last lesson we learn from the locusts is that locusts are usually seen in the Bible as a sign of the judgment of God. And the Bible says a lot about locusts. That's why I'm not quite sure we're going to make it all the way through, but I'm going to give it my best shot today. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, those are written right after the entering of the promised land. And God, you remember, commanded the tribes of Israel to divide in half and to stand on two different mountaintops, on top of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Those that were standing on the top of Mount Gerizim were to pronounce the blessings of God upon the people for their obedience to the word of God. Those who stood upon the top of Mount Ebal were supposed to pronounce the cursings that God would place on the people if they did not obey his word. So Gerizim, you have the blessings. Ebal, you have the curses. Now imagine several million people divided on two mountains and chanting in unison, we do a responsive reading here. Sometimes I wonder even if our radio audience can hear it because you're out there and the microphones are facing this direction. But we read these things responsively, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Imagine, even if you have your minimum number of Israelites, I think it was a lot more than this, but suppose two million. That's what's often suggested as going out of the land of Egypt. I think it was probably close to seven or eight or nine or ten million people, but that's all right, doesn't matter, um, because they would have had more than the average American family of 1.8 children, which I think is down now, now down to about 1.5 per household. But a million people standing on one mountain and across a very large valley, a million people standing on the other mountain, and all of them chanting at the top of their voice the blessings of God, and the others chanting the curses of God. Do you think that would have made an impression on their children? I think it would. Do we teach our children the blessings and the curses of God? That's what's happening here in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. And we get down to verses 38 and 42 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and thou shalt gather but little in. For the locust shall consume it. Verse 42, all thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. Do you think that they had anything in mind at the point they were chanting this? This is right after they've gone through the 40 years in the wilderness. They finally have gotten into the land. They're standing on the mountains. What do you think was the first thing that came to their mind? The plague of locusts in Egypt. The adults who came out of Egypt didn't make it into the land, but the children did. They would have remembered that plague. They'd been reminded that they were to teach their sons and their sons' sons. What do you think they're doing here on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim? You know, we're not under the law today. God established here for Israel what we call, though, the law of harvest. This is the law of harvest in the Old Testament. 
That's a principle that's clearly restated in the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. The picture is about sowing crops, remember? You're going to carry much seed out into the field. You're going to gather a little because the locust is going to consume it. All the trees and the fruit are going to get consumed by the locust. So the law of harvest is about sowing a certain kind of crops. Think of locusts when you read Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Think of locusts. Here's one of the key passages about the law of harvest. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, think locusts. That shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Think locusts. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, that is, sowing in the Spirit. For in due season we shall reap. The locusts will not have eaten it. We shall reap if we faint not. You know, I have to remember that verse a lot of times. Sometimes it's very discouraging to be in ministry. It has been ever since I got out of seminary. Even when I was in seminary, there were, there were times when I was discouraged. But just remember verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It is easy to become weary in well-doing. But you know, that's not the only place that Paul gives that exhortation. Think about the church at Thessalonica. The Thessalonians were working hard. As you read through the New Testament, and some of you have heard me preaching on that subject in the evening services as we've gone through the book of Acts. The Thessalonians worked hard. They were a missionary-minded church. But even with their hard work for the Lord, they were getting very, very, very little results. People were trying to convince them that their eschatology was wrong. People were mocking them for the doctrine of the promised rapture. People were mocking them about the appearance of the Antichrist. You know, that's what First and Second Thessalonians really focused on, is the return of Christ. And Paul is writing to them not to be discouraged. They were becoming discouraged as they waited for the Lord's return. So Paul wrote, this is Second Thessalonians 3.13, But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Precisely the same thing that he'd written to the churches of Galatia. Be not weary in well-doing. I know some of you are weary in well-doing. You've been here for years and decades. And some of you have been here for half a century or longer. Have you ever been weary? Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. But there's a caveat. If we faint not. That means, hang in there. God always keeps his promises. Oh, that we might learn it practically. The law of harvest is all over the Bible. I'm just going to give you a few of these. Now, I want to stop and say something first. Harvest relates to works. Salvation relates to faith. Harvest relates to works. Salvation relates to faith. But let's talk about harvest for a moment. About the rewards that we get for hanging in there. Here's the law of harvest all over the Bible. Start with Obadiah, and these are scattered verses. I mean, there are so many of them, I've just, I've just put down a few. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. That's the law of harvest. What you sow, you reap. How about Isaiah chapter 33, verse 1? Woe to thee that spoilest. And thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an ant to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. What you sow is what you reap. What you sow is what you reap. That is the law of harvest. How about Proverbs 14:14? 14, 14? The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied from himself. 
Or 2 Samuel 22, 26, and 27. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward wilt thou show thyself unsavory. What you sow, you reap. What you sow, you reap. What you sow, you reap. Works are related to harvest. Salvation is related to faith. But works are related to harvest. Works are related to rewards. Works are your payback with the reward that you get, whether good or bad. How about Revelation 13.10? He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Don't be weary in well-doing. You're looking around you. Things are really bad. It's not going to be anywhere near as bad as it will be during the tribulation. And yet, during the tribulation, there had to be this encouragement given. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Just remember, the ones who are leading you into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Law of harvest. So reap, so reap, so reap. Isaiah 3, verses 10 and 11. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. The law of harvest is all over the Bible. It's not just in Galatians. It's not just a new idea that Paul came up with. It is a principle that God has established in the operation of the world. I wish we had a time to look at uh, all the places harvest and works are connected, specifically gaining or losing heavenly rewards. Let me just give you a couple more. Psalm 62, 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. You know, have you ever heard that phrase before, according to his work? Reward of his hands shall be given him according to his work. That's picked up in the book of Revelation. In fact, it's picked up several times in the book of Revelation. It's something that not only applies back in the Psalms, 1000 BC, it applies at the end of the tribulation. It applies when, at the end of the millennium, God raises the dead and assigns them their permanent locations. That same phrase. Revelation 20, verses 11 and following. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Now, did you catch it? In this verse, there are books and a book. Books and a book, plural and a singular. The book of life is open. They're not found written in the book of life. They're not going to make it to heaven. But then books are opened, which examine their lives to determine what their reward will be. Listen to this. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, let me pause for just a second, get our eschatology straight here. This is the great white throne judgment. This is not the Bema Seat of Christ. There are no believers who show up in front of the great white throne judgment. They've already been judged at the judgment seat of Christ. That is a different word, a different location, a different time. That takes place when the rapture takes place, the Bema seat takes place, and the wedding feast of the Lamb takes place in heaven while the tribulation is going on down on the earth. Then Christ comes back at the second coming. We find some other judgments that are there. We find Satan cast into the bottomless pit. We find the dividing of the sheep and the goat nations. We find the entrance in the millennial period. And then we come to the end of the millennium, and that's where we have the great white throne judgment, which is what we find here. Believers are going to get, according to their works also, they're already saved, not by works, but by faith, but they're going to get rewards. That takes place at the judgment seat of Christ. But now we have everybody else at the end of that millennial period before the entrance into the eternal state. None of them are going to get saved. Their names are not in the book of life but the books that record their works 
are laid out on the table. And they're judged, every man according to his works. What is the penalty of the temperature of hell, if you will, that they're going to have to experience for all of eternity? Revelation 22. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. That's Jesus speaking. You know, that's the last book of the Bible. Job, which is probably the oldest book of the Old Testament. Job 34.11. We still find the law of harvest. For the work of a man shall he render unto him and cause every man to find according to his ways. That's out of Job. You see, the law of harvest is all over the Bible. And locusts are given as one of the principal illustrations of it. And they are given at the inception of Israel as a nation when they enter the promised land. And they are stated among the curses that were pronounced from Mount Ebal by at least one million people. Not only in the hearing of all those on that mountain, but across the valley into Mount Gerizim. Locusts are a sign of God's judgment. I wish we had more time to talk about the law of harvest and work. Second Chronicles 6.30, Isaiah 59.18, Ezekiel 18.30, Jeremiah 32.19. <laughs> I, mean, I, could, I could list lots of verses here. Let me just stop on one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 8 through 14. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. What are we talking about? We're talking about some harvest here, aren't we? Talking about planting something and something growing up. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. That's works. The same picture is given in terms of planting and harvesting. Is something going to eat it up? The locust can certainly do it. God can send the locust of whatever type is necessary to eat up whatever you thought you were going to get by doing evil. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, or on the other hand, wood, hay, stubble, every man's, what's the next word? Every man's, you don't know this verse? Work. Work. W-O-R-K. Every man's work shall be made manifest. That means it's going to be openly and clearly revealed. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. You and I will not stand at the great white throne judgment and be cast into hell. That's not the fire it's talking about here. Those people all end in the lake of fire. Read Revelation chapters 20 through 22. But our work is going to be tested with fire to test what it is made out of. Was it the result of believing the word of God and obeying the word of God? Was it the result of the Holy Spirit's empowerment in our life or the flesh? Was it the result of we walked by faith, not merely had faith in our head, or we were trying to manipulate? Every man's work shall be tried of what sort it is. And you know, when God puts the blowtorch to our works, all of our works are going to be set on a shelf before us. We're going to be there in heaven. The whole congregation of all those who have loved the Lord Jesus Christ and are in heaven, they're going to be watching and say, wow, what's, look at that pile of stuff he's got there. wonder what's going to last. And the flamethrower comes out. I know some of you have seen those war movies where they, they have these tanks on their backs and they've got a little nozzle kind of a thing with that all of a sudden out of it comes this humongous flame napalm of some kind going out there and it destroys everything in its path. People are burned to a crisp. 
The fire is going to test your works. It's going to test my works. What are you building? It may look good now. When the fire hits it, what is it going to look like? Wood, hay, and stubble are going to burn up. But gold, silver, and precious stone make it through the fire. In fact, fire refines gold. Fire refines silver. Matthew 16, here's Jesus. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. We're not talking salvation. We've already said that. Let me make it clear again. We're talking eternal heavenly rewards. We're talking what are you going to have when you stand before Jesus, and as you enter into eternity, what will you have for all the rest of eternity? Your opportunity for earning it is now, not then, not yesterday. Your opportunity is now until Christ takes you home. Again, what did Jesus say? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We are to make these works visible the way in which we live our life so that others will know there's a distinction between us and the pagans around us. Because that brings glory to God in heaven. There's another side to this story too. We're almost out of time, not quite yet. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. Here's a passage describing apostates, wicked teachers, those who can do actually supernatural miracles, it says, No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. They are fakes. They look like the real thing on the outside, but they're fakes. You can tell it by what they do. Now listen to the last phrase. Whose end shall be according to their what do you think the word is? Works. Do you understand how much the Bible talks about works? We, we tend to avoid it because we're so emphatic, and it's important to be emphatic on this. We're so emphatic that salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone of the scriptures alone. But folks, God has a lot to say about works, not for your salvation, but because he requires them of us so that we will be a testimony for him. And he has promised us when we do them by faith in the power of his spirit in obedience to the word of God and to the glory of God. Those are the four tests for a good work. Remember, I've taught you that in the past. I hope you remember the four tests for a good work. Not good works according to human standards, but good works according to God's standards. The four things. He's promised to give us things of inestimable value. Things that last forever, that will not corrupt, that will not fade away. The crowns in heaven. Things that with joy we'll be able to remove. And as we see in Revelation, cast them at the feet of the Lamb and say, Worthy art thou, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us unto God by thy blood to receive glory and honor and power and riches and blessing. We'll understand that our works that were good works really weren't ours. Jesus did them through us. That's Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good... What? Works. Created unto good works that we should walk in them. God is previously ordained that we should walk in good works. How much the scripture says about it, not for salvation, not for sanctification, but as the manifestation of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to reveal that we truly believe in Christ and it has transformed our lives. Huh. Time is up. 
I'll just list the references. Ephesians 2.10, 1 Timothy 2.10, 1 Timothy 5.10, 1 Timothy 5.25, 1 Timothy 6.18, 2 Timothy 3.17, 2 Timothy 4.14, Titus 1.16, Titus 2.7, Titus 2.14. You, you realize how many times the Bible talks about good works? There's a faithful saying, this is Titus 3.8. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto man. Titus 3.14, just six verses later. Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Did you realize that doing good works is connected to fruit bearing? And what have we been talking about? We've been talking about growing fruit. We've been talking about growing harvest. We've been talking about planting and sowing and growing. And we've been talking about locusts. I haven't gotten off the subject. Locusts are God's judgment. And they come in many different forms. To eat the fruit that you've worked so hard for. And by the way, that same passage there, verse 5, just three verses before verse 8, which I just read you, makes it clear that works are not for salvation, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's in exactly the same passage. Works are not for salvation. Works are not for sanctification. Works are for manifestation. That you are saved and that the Spirit of God works in you to produce in you the fruit of the Spirit, which never can be eaten by the locusts. Hebrews 10.24, James 2.14-18, James 3.13, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Colossians 1.10, 2 Thessalonians 2.17, Hebrews 13.21, 2 Chronicles 15.7, Galatians 5.10, or excuse me, 6.10, 1 Kings 8.39. You, you get the point that works and harvest are connected? When you get a bad harvest because of sin, what are you supposed to do? What happened in Egypt? Why did Pharaoh get eaten by locusts? The solution to the law of harvest when destruction comes because of sin, the only solution is repentance. Locusts are one of the ways that God uses to lead men to repentance. That's one of the principal lessons from the plague of locusts that's reiterated over and over and over in the Bible. Our time is up. I was going to give you an example out of Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. Wisest man of the Old Testament understood the principle of the harvest and the locust. We're going to have to save that for next week. We're going to have to save also our study from the book of Revelation. There are locusts in Revelation that parallel the plague of the plague of locusts in the book of Exodus. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. There's so much to teach us here. We've been all over the Bible today, Old Testament, New Testament, seeing how, how you've used the locusts to warn your people of judgment to come. We're not merely learning the history of the Exodus. We're learning the standards that you have set, the blessings that you give, the judgments that you send. We're hopefully learning like the people did on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. That there are certain things that always follow obedience. And there are certain things that always follow disobedience. Certain things that always follow faith in your word. And certain things that always follow disbelief of your word. Your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. I pray, Father, that you will use your word as a surgeon's scalpel this day and cut out all that is dead and decayed and rotted and filthy and stinking and vile. Heal us by your spirit. Renew us. Strengthen us. Cause us to plant good seed. Cause us to understand the law of harvest. And not to sow to the flesh, but to sow to the spirit. For if we sow to the flesh, we'll reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, we reap life everlasting. 
And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If, if we faint not. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.